Hi again. This lecture and your reading on standards for professional editors are the foundation for your discussion post this week. Most of what I'm going to cover this lecture is a summary of things that we've discussed, but there are a couple of course concepts or competencies that we've not talked about yet, so you'll hear a little bit of new information as well. Here we go. My primary goal in this final lecture is to review a few core concepts in tech editing, present 12 competencies for technical editors, and I'll end by recommending resources for continuing to develop your knowledge in this area. I want to start by reviewing three core concepts. These were all mentioned, obviously, earlier in the course. I define tech editing by expanding on Merriam-Webster's definition of the verb edit with examples specific to technical editing. So preparing for technical publication might mean editing a user's guide before distribution with a software product. Assembly by cutting and rearranging might mean editing a recorded webinar before you release it as employee training. Finally, altering to bring about conformity to a standard might mean editing a topic file in a component content management system to implement the standard called DITA. Another core concept in the course is that there are two categories of publishers for whom tech editors work. Traditional publishers include newspapers and book or periodical publishers. Non-traditional publishers include all of the organizations now making content public on the web. Before we move on to competencies, I also want to reiterate that traditional publishers are projected to offer general editors and other media workers fewer job opportunities and lower salaries than non-traditional publishers over the next 10 years. That means the job outlook for tech editors within non-traditional publishing is relatively good. In fact, it's good compared to all occupations. Remember that in these type of organizations, many tech editors are managing groups of tech writers. To present required competencies, I'm going to refer to the fundamental knowledge and practices required of professional editors as presented in this 2016 publication from the Editors Association of Canada. Although those 12 standards are not specific to tech editors, they definitely encompass the work done by them and their standards also apply in both traditional and non-traditional publishing. I should warn you in advance, I'm not going to discuss the 12 standards in their published order. Let's start with the first and sixth standards, which state that editors must know the publishing process, including at least something about the design and production processes. I've repeatedly described tech editors as intermediaries who work among stakeholders involved in content publication. One stakeholder is the commissioning body. In a previous lecture, the commissioning body was a non-traditional publisher named Precor, a company that designs and builds premium exercise equipment. The second stakeholder group is the author or group of content creators. At Precore, that included tech writers, engineers, product managers, marketing professionals, etc. I showed you Jeff Hart's list of all the different individuals who might review and alter content before it's delivered in a non-traditional publishing environment. The third stakeholder group is the audience for the content. In the case of Precore, that included buyers and facilities personnel working for companies like Marriott International. Perhaps the most important point here is that the tech editor does more collaboratively than independently. The moral of the story I told about Precore was that their content strategists, who also serve the role as tech editors, improved the company's content quality assurance process. Those process improvements created business value by reducing translation costs and improving customer satisfaction, especially with localized content targeted for their international customers. Precor's content strategists knew how to communicate the business value of the editorial process changes. If you'll be working for or with non-traditional publishers, you should get ready for that challenge. During the course, I've used this graphic to describe the overall publishing process. 
even though things differ somewhat depending on the type of material that's being published and whether we're talking about traditional or non-traditional publishers. The size of the company in which editors work determines how much they need to know about design during the production phase and preparation for digital delivery. For example, a large traditional book publisher separates duties so that editors need to know relatively little about these processes except how their role interfaces with people like authors, proofreaders, graphic designers. However, a small non-traditional publisher, let's say a tech startup, typically needs an editor who performs multiple roles. That might mean one person is the tech editor, tech writer, marketing copywriter, and web or interface designer. All tech editors need to understand basic conventions for typography and layout, as well as for displaying things like tables and figures, other visual elements. They also need to know how the interrelationship between text, format, and design can affect readability and accessibility. This is the reason all of our grad students are required to take a communication or document design course. The second standard states that editors need to understand the importance of audience and purpose of the material that's being published. In other words, tech editors must be able to recommend content, organization and style for each specific project based on its rhetorical context. One size, or style, does not fit all. One of the reasons your first major assignment in the course was a structural edit was to emphasize the importance of rhetorical context when creating content. The fourth standard states that editors need to know the medium, or the genre, of the material being published. Your assigned reading in Module 1 provided the results of a survey of tech editors. Those results listed the wide variety of materials commonly edited by them. I've listed some of them on this slide. Because genre knowledge is a critical competency for tech editors, they typically specialize in a genre, for example, online software user guides, or an industry, medical research. The eighth standard states that editors must be able to identify the appropriate editorial intervention for each project. In Module 1, we saw the survey results from those 190 tech editors from back in 2011. Their most common activity was copy editing or proofreading, but multiple levels of edit were the norm. So this standard means editors must understand and assess content quality at multiple levels of edit. Not all editing projects involve comprehensive editing. The focus of structural editing is different from the focus in proofreading. Based on the level of edit they've been asked to prioritize, editors must be able to recommend edits to improve the quality of content according to appropriate standards. In order to diagnose the aspects of content that should be the focus of editorial intervention, editors require foundational knowledge about macro-level concerns, let's say content development and its organization, as well as micro-level concerns, like word choice and punctuation. The third standard states that editors must know how the scope of an editing project affects processes, and the seventh is related because it focuses on schedules. I introduced the triple constraints to quality in Module 2 and repeated it several times throughout the course. That's because the triple constraints make it clear scope, time, and cost are interrelated. If you change one, the others change. I told you a story involving the editor Richard Aiden and a book author to illustrate how scope was affected by the time allowed for a copy edit. One of the points was that editor-author relationship problems often result from a misunderstanding about scope. Editors must know how to adjust time and cost to match the scope of an editing project, and they must know how to communicate that to authors and others involved in the publishing process. I've showed you this table from the EFA as one way of demonstrating how the schedule for editing reflects scope as well as cost. I also shared Joshi's 60-minute process for assessing the quality of a document. 
as a means of estimating the time needed for an editorial project based on the priorities for that specific document. The tenth standard states that editors must be able to use common editing resources. Common resources, especially for copy editing, include the style guide, which provides comprehensive guidelines for material, and the style sheet, which captures the editorial choices made for a specific project when there are options in the style guide. Copy editors must know which style guide applies to the specific material they're editing. For non-traditional publishers, Establishing and maintaining the brand of the organization is the most important reason for having and using a style guide. Common resources for editors also include software tools. We devoted time to the use of Microsoft Word. We focused on styles, track changes, auto text, find and replace, macros. We also learned about Word plugins like Editor's Toolkit Plus, which provide macros for common copy editing tasks. Finally, we learned about advanced editorial tools, tools like Acrolinks, which are used by large non-traditional publishers to push style guidance to all content creators in the organization. And they do that while the content creators are actually using their authoring tool, whether that's Word or FrameMaker or XMetal. Editorial tools help editors produce higher quality content by reducing the time it takes to edit and reducing the number of errors introduced during the publishing process. The 11th standard states that editors must be able to communicate edits clearly. Although copy editors can use proofreader's marks on either hard or digital copy, the most common tools are track changes and embedded comments or queries in digital files commonly done in Word. One of the advantages of on-screen editing is that it makes it easier for editors to keep a record of successive versions of material. It helps them identify who made the changes and to take steps to ensure that all parties are using the current version of a document. On-screen editing is also done in tech authoring tools like Madcap Flare or FrameMaker. Using track changes in particular has three advantages. One, they appear in the material as suggestions, which can be accepted or rejected by an author or reviewer. Two, their meaning is usually clear. And three, they're efficient because all the reviewer or author has to do is click accept and the change is made automatically and exactly as suggested by the editor. Because time pressure for authors and reviewers of content is real and affects whether they accept or adopt editorial recommendations, editors have to adopt clear and efficient ways of communicating their edits. That's one major reason why on-screen editing has become the norm. The standards also mention the importance of communicating tactfully with stakeholders throughout the publication process. Evidence from a survey of authors in Module 3 showed that if tech editors want their recommendations adopted, they have to work at making them polite. That helps them avoid complaints about things like harshness, being too nitpicky, over-editing. It's important to remember that most authors want the opportunity to meet with their editors face-to-face -face as well. The 12th standard states that editors must introduce no new errors during their work. In other words, editorial recommendations shouldn't alter the author's intended meaning. I've shared warnings from several professional editors about the need to respect the border between editing and authoring. Especially with technical information, it's critical for editors not to assume that the author is wrong. Instead, editors should make their attitude one of do no harm. I've left the fifth and ninth standards to the end of this lecture because this is the first time I've mentioned editors need to know about and deal with legal and ethical requirements that are involved in publishing. The ethical requirements editors deal with include confidentiality and privacy. For instance, content being edited may contain information that should be disclosed only to authorized parties, or the identity of reviewers used during publication may be confidential. Editors also address biased, non-inclusive, and offensive material. In a 2018 post on the ACES website, 
Proofreader Allison Rudolph provided five tips for calling out bias with confidence. Let me quote her bottom line. Above all, remember, you're not changing a mind, you're changing a word. She suggests that editors simply correct bias language and provide a brief authoritative comment the first time they do it. For example, revised per CMOS 17. Major style guides and dictionaries support inclusive language. If these corrections seem outside the scope of your editorial role or the editing level you're working at, you can always add a comment that signals you recognize it but are offering the suggestion anyway. The legal requirements editors deal with are primarily copyright and plagiarism. The author of a book titled Copyright and Permissions, What Every Writer and Editor Should Know, her name Elsa Peterson, wrote, I quote, Copyright is a vast, fascinating subject. That means I cannot possibly do justice to it in a few minutes. So I'm going to give you five important things that you should know. First, copyright does not require any notice or registration. These things provide extra protections, so wise publishers do both, but they're not required for material to be protected. Second, only fixed Tangible works, something like an architectural plan, can be copyrighted. Never ideas, and not even fictional characters, although sometimes those are trademarked, which is a different type of legal protection. Third, the rules for fair use of copyrighted material without obtaining permission are so nonspecific as to be opaque. That's why publishers develop what they call rules of thumb, like the maximum number of words that can be used without permission. Attributing material to the original source is one important way to play within the rules of fair use. Finally, copyright is so complex that traditional publishers hire a permissions editor, usually at the beginning of the production phase. That editor identifies material that requires permissions, they contact copyright holders and negotiate permission, and that includes negotiating fees for the use of material, and sometimes even recommending replacement material when permission is denied. Tech editors working for non-traditional publishers should probably be familiar with some additional concepts related to intellectual property law, like maybe trademarks, patents. I really recommend Peterson's book. It was published by the EFA, it's well worth buying at $12.25 for the paperback, just $8.99 for the EPUB. You'll find a link to purchase it in the To Learn More area of Canvas for Module 8. You'll also find a link to the Rights, Permissions, and Copyright Administration chapter in CMOS. Before I close this video, let me make sure you know there are many other resources listed on Canvas for this module. These include links to the websites of active bloggers, as well as the professional organizations shown on this slide. I encourage you to join at least one professional organization so that you can benefit from the experiences, including mistakes, of others. In this final lecture, I reviewed a few core concepts for defining tech editing for understanding both traditional and non-traditioning publishers and the job outlook for tech editors. Then I summarized the 12 required competencies listed by the Editors Association of Canada. Editors must know the publishing process, the importance of rhetorical context in assessing the quality of content, the medium or genre of the material they edit, the levels of edit and how scope affects the time and cost of editorial projects, how to use tools for editing that ensure edits are communicated clearly, efficiently and tactfully, without introducing new errors. Editors must also know the ethical and legal issues involved in publishing, so I ended by recommending resources for continuing to develop your knowledge in this area and in tech editing in general. You now understand a good bit about technical editing, about technical editors, what they do, how they can do their work best, whether that's within a traditional publishing environment or a non-traditional environment. I hope that some of my passion for tech editing has rubbed off on you. 
I've definitely enjoyed watching your journey in the course. Uh, I have seen progress in terms of your own understanding of the different levels of edit, your competence with things like copy editing. I hope that you'll continue to share your journey with me. Please connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know what's happening. Best of luck. <music>